Sunday. Anybody excited? Yes, yes, right there. Yes, thank you, sir. That's good. I'm excited to be preaching for week number two, pun intended. Week number two, get your ship together. Next week will be the third week of get your ship together. Uh, you know, can we... Anybody love God here? Anybody love our pastors, Pastor Rolando, Pastor Lisa? Can we give it up for them? Anybody grateful? So grateful for them, but I'm also grateful for this community, this dream team that comes in week after week, some day after day. Can we give it up for our community, our dream team that makes this possible? We are in week number two. Um, with no further delay, I want to make a constipation joke, but I won't. Uh, let's go into our opening text, James chapter 3, verse 2 through 5. It says, we all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way, and that means our character is mature and fully developed. Horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that we can control and guide their large body, and the same with mighty ships, though they are massive, though these mighty ships are massive and driven by fierce winds, they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. I want to talk to you guys today about my message. Uh, I want to, the title of what I want to talk about today is called Handle Your Ship. Look, look to your neighbor and say, Handle Your Ship. Handle your ship. Let's pray and pray for me, guys. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this message series. I thank you that you are moving in this church in Christ uncensored. I thank you. And I just ask that in this moment you go before me, that I may get out of the way and you may step into this room and begin to speak to everyone here. And I include myself in that, Lord. In your name, amen. What a series. I, I told Ro we should do this series as a joke. I was like, yo, we should do a series on Noah called Get Your Ship Together. And he said, I love it. And I was like, okay, I guess we're going to do this. What's next? Summer series. Life's a beach. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you, he said yes. I'm like, oof. The amount of ship jokes I have, guys, is unreal. It has just been yeah, it's just, yeah. But I want to talk to you guys today about handling our ship. James is talking about the rudder, but as he's talking about the rudder, which is the tongue, he says this, he says, the tongue is powerful, so powerful that if you can master your mouth, you are fully developed. And we all fail in many ways, and he gives us this promise of a way to be fully developed. Anybody wish they could be perfect here? I, I, I wanna see some hands, hands raised. If you have ever wished, I wish I could just be perfect. I wish I was perfect and never made any mistakes. Just keep your hands up, I wanna, I'm gonna keep asking some questions. Have you ever failed in life? If you've ever failed in life, can you raise your hand? Okay. Have you ever felt embarrassed or ashamed? Keep your hands up, everybody keep your hands up, hands up, hands up. Have you ever felt embarrassed, shamed? Have you ever felt defeated? Hands up. Have you ever felt defeated? Keep your hands up. We're, we're getting our calories in, guys. Have you ever wished that you could just 
get over it. Keep your hand up. If all apply, put your hands and your feet up. No, I'm kidding. Hands up, hands up. I, I want us to look around the room. And the first thing I want you guys to know in this moment and what I'm about to talk about is going to get somber. Feelings are going to be felt, but I want you to know you're not alone. Some way or another, we've all been at the face of defeat and failure, and failure not just of the world, but of ourselves. You ever felt like you were your own worst enemy? Yeah. You guys can put your hands down. Thank you. Applaud yourselves for being vulnerable, honestly, and being honest. You know, I read this verse, and man, I'm like, I thought the Bible was supposed to be encouraging. My man James is saying, if you want to be perfect, master your mouth. James, you're talking shit. <laughs> and honestly, though, there's nothing more humbling than this. We all fail in many ways, yet if we can bridle the words we say, we're powerful enough to control ourselves. And that means our character is mature and fully developed. And I read this and it brings me to a place of James. I can't. And it's such an emotionally profound moment in my own heart that I, you know, I reflected in it in the way that I reflect best. And that's through spoken word. And I want to share that with you now. Um, but before I do that, what I want to do is encourage us in this moment to embrace vulnerability. Because as I speak this spoken word, I don't speak it just on behalf of Reuben. I speak it on behalf of every hand that was raised up, every hand that's been at the face of failure and defeat and has felt, my God, when is, like, when am I just going to get my ship together? And so I just ask that if you could be vulnerable in this moment. And so I'm also going to use some of the little bit that I know about psychology on you guys. Um, and so I'm going to ask us if we could just... Meditate a little. That's right. That's fair, right? Nobody's going to call me a heretic? Okay. We're going to me meditate. So we're just going to do small. We're going to close our eyes. We're just going to take a big, deep breath in. And we're going to exhale. Let it all out. And then as you do that, let's keep doing that. Inhale. I want you to just rub your hands together as if you're washing them. Don't sing the happy birthday song for this stuff. Just... I want you to rub your hands together and breathe in and breathe out. And I want to challenge you again. No one's under any compulsion here at home. You're not forced to do this. You can just watch. But if you would be, if you're wanting to step into vulnerability and participate in this message with me, not just listen, I want you to go to those, that moment, the last moment, or the moment that's been in your mind on repeat of failure and defeat. I just want you to hold on to it as I, I speak this spoken word. You guys can come back. I just want you to embrace vulnerability. I'm being vulnerable, guys. It's the first time I share a spoken word in a message, and so if it's not good, don't tell me. That's it. It was just a breath. I'm kidding. It's like I was born broken. Never had any faith to hope in up a creek without a paddle, nothing left to stay afloat with. Only hope is these days that these waves might open. I really can't handle this shit. I really can't handle this shit. To be clear, that's S-H-I-P. But really, it feels more like a grave, R-I-P. And I really can't get a grip. I really can't get a grip. And here comes the book of James with wisdom. Saying that if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. Yeah, James, ironically, that's easier to say than to do. You must not have been through what I've been through. Because you see, James, the problem is my mind's eye can't help but tell lies. And thoughts are just the seeds that birth speech. So how can I ever control my mouth when my trauma's been playing on repeat? How can I not curse people out when my mind doesn't know the difference between the person in front of me and the, every single person who's hurt me? How am I supposed to manifest or speak things as though they were when the only thing that I could hear is the verbal abuse that I've endured for each and every year? 
Bullies drilling into me that I am a loser. Family telling me that I am not enough. And that one ex, that one ex that said they loved me best, but I am undeserving of it. How can I ever change course, James, when this ship was beaten and battered before it ever set sail? Feels like I'm always under defeat. Feels like I'm always under defeat. And I'm just trying to keep my head afloat. But I've been shouting out SOS. SOS. My sensations are often sadness. SOS. My suppression's only suffering. SOS. My subconscious opposes success. SOS. I'm stuck on self sabotaging. SOS. My, sabbat- my sanity's on sabbatical. And I really can't handle this shit. I really can't handle this shit. Have any of us been there? Where you are caught between the standards of society and expectations and even Christianity and you just cannot get it together. This is the place that this text brings me. It's almost like James wants to set us up for failure because he tells us we all fail in many areas right there with you but especially with our words. Yet if we bridle the words we say, we can control ourselves. That means our character is fully developed. And so the tongue is a small part that carries great power. Okay, James, so so what do I have to do to be perfect? Because I want to stop failing. I want to stop feeling that way. You got to master your mouth, okay? And then he says, here's the challenge. Here's the powerful thing that you have to learn to control. He says the tongue is a small part of the body. James chapter five, uh, James chapter three, verses five through six. The tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries a great power. Just think how a small flame can get a huge, can set a huge forest ablaze, and the tongue is a fire. That's what you have to master. It can, can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body. That's what you have to master. It corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. This is what I'm up against. And a text that started out hopeful, hey, we all fail, but if we want to be perfect, we can master our tongue, says, oh, by the way, This thing is the most dangerous thing in the human body. This thing speaks fire. And you know what's crazy is he's not wrong because I think we've been all been on the recipient end of the fire from other people's mouths. (laughs) Having to be set free from parents telling us when we were kids, you're so stupid. And that's not a hypothetical example. That's one that our own lead pastor had to be set free from, from the verbal abuse of my father. Children are to be seen, not heard. Grew up hearing that because I was a loud kid and very audible. And so we, it's true. And then this is what he says. He says, this is crazy, guys. This is what you have to master, your tongue. But by the way, James chapter 3, verse 7 through 8, every wild animal on earth, including birds, creeping reptiles, creatures of the sea and the land, have all been overpowered and tamed by humans. And like, James didn't have YouTube, but I do. And like, yo, like people pet lions. Have you seen these videos? Like I've seen the YouTube videos of homeboy is like in the safari and a lion's running up to him and I'm like, the lion's gonna eat him, right? That's what happens. Why are they allowing this on YouTube? And then the lion runs up to him and cuddles him and licks him, gets on his back for belly rubs. Lions! Like, like, yeah, we've mastered every animal. I was on Instagram, sure enough, I was going over my sermon, said that, and then the algorithm was like, you want to see lions hugging people? And then just reel after reel of literal people, like we have literally mastered 
and tamed every animal. Lions. But the tongue is not able to be tamed. Like if we could master every single animal and tame every animal, we, we can't tame the tongue. How powerful is this thing? And I, I didn't come to talk to you about the tongue today. Because what this leads me to is how impossible it is to handle my ship because I can't master the thing that he said I need to master. And it's like he's setting us up for failure because he says, hey, if you want to be perfect, control your mouth. By the way, we can't control our mouths. The tongue is not able to be tamed. And I, and I think, church, that the reason why we can't control our mouths and why it's so impossible to master is that it's simply just a reflection of our internal state. Like your speech is just the fruit of the condition of your mind. But this thing, before we had the time to even think our own conscious, conscious thoughts was being shaped and formed by our environment. Pastor Marquez has said this amazing quote, children are great observers horrible translators. So our mind has been wired to think a certain way and there's really just so much pain here. So how can I ever produce fruit from this? Speaking of, if you want to be more sobered, James has a lot more of that for us. He continues about the tongue. He says, it is a fickle, unrestrained evil that spews out words of toxic poison. We use our tongue to praise God, our father, and then turn around and curse a person who was made in his very image. Out of the same mouth, we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. My brothers and sisters, this should never be. Would you look for olives on a, hanging on a fig tree? Or to pick, go to pick figs from a grapevine? Is it possible that fresh and bitter water can flow out of the same spring? So neither can a bitter spring produce fresh water. And I, I want you to remember that we all had our hands raised up at the start of this talk. This is an all-inclusive heart check. And see, the problem with James is most people take James and they preach him at people. And I don't think James was trying to preach at people. He even uses we language in here. I think he was trying to diagnose in his community the state of affairs. Like, hey, this is where we're at, guys. We are bitter springs. He says, you can't find those contradictions in nature. You can't find a spring that produces both bitter and fresh water. You can't find a fig tree that produces olives. You can't find a grapevine that produces figs. But you know what you can find? Humans that produce both blessing and cursing from the same mouth. We are living dichotomies and contradictions and we are just trying to do our best, but the odds are stacked against us. And I don't know if this takes you there, but it brings me to a sudden awareness of how far I am from being a fresh spring. Have you been there, church? Aware of what the standard is and how far off you are from it, or even better, that the closer you get to it, like I've been healed. I thought I went through therapy. I went to Matrix and I threw it in the fire. You, this is what you do at Matrix Retreat. You write what you're dealing with. You throw it in the fire and three months later, you're like, how'd it get back in my hand? Like I've been healed. I've been through therapy, I've been through counseling, I, I've, I've been delivered, I've come to altar calls where my bondage was set free and I'm getting closer and closer but the closer I get, the further I feel. Have you been there? It's, it's actually a psychological phenomenon that they found works in humans. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I've worked really hard to say that. I promise you, the first time I said I said Donnie Wahlberg effect. 
Dunning-Kruger. And this is what they found, that the less people know about a subject matter, the more confident they are about it. Hence why social media is the way that it is. Anyway, the more people know about a subject matter, the less confident they are about their knowledge. And I think here's why. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. Now imagine when it's about yourself. And it's about the subject of healing. And I've stepped into healing, but now that I'm healed, I know that that's not healthy. So I gotta go heal from that. And the closer I get to God, and the more healed I am, and the closer I get to the standard, the more and more I realize that I was actually further and further away. So how? How do I handle this shit? That's why I don't like James, I like Paul. So you have writers like Paul who encapsulate this feeling so perfectly and vividly. And and, in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 18, he says this, this is Paul. He says, I'm a mystery to myself. For what I want to do is right, but end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. And my behavior is not in line with my desire. My conscience still confirms the excellence of the law. And now I realize that it is no longer my true self doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. For I know nothing good lives within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me, but my willpower is not enough to accomplish it. And I'm going to tell you something that I, I don't hear from the pulpit often enough. Maybe, maybe you know, I feel like all our pastors are Christ uncensored or aware of this, but most preachings are not. See, I believe that we all want to do what is right. And oftentimes, this, this, these kinds of messages get into this kind of like, you got to be aware of the devil and you got to flee from temptation and handle your ship. Ah, no. My man Paul, the founder of our faith in many ways, who made the faith accessible to Gentiles, says, My willpower isn't enough, but I want to do it. And it is a psychological diagnosis to not have a conscience. It's called. So, so being a sociopath, sociopathy, so I don't know how to pronounce that correctly, sociopathy. Sociopaths have no sense of right and wrong. It's either so, sociopaths or psychopaths, one of the paths. And what does that mean? Fundamentally, we are wired to want to do right. But fundamentally, our willpower is not enough. And I've been there. Sounds like you guys have all been there too. I've I've prayed this prayer. Like, Lord, I just want to please you. I just want to do what is right. I just want to throw this sin away. I just, I just, I'm tired. But sometimes our willpower is not enough, Lord. And the worst is when you've, it's the thing that you thought you had conquered like you thought you, you solved your anger issues, went to anger management, did the whole thing, went to a retreat. Here you are two years later and you thought you kicked that addiction. Here you are five years later, relapsing. It's the worst. And I think because we have a meritocracy society that, that judges us based on merit and your progress is based on what you've produced. And so if I'm accomplishing something, but now I'm back in the thing that I had accomplished, that must mean I regressed. But in Alcoholic Anonymous and addiction courses, what they teach, the fundamental thing that they teach is relapse is a part of recovery. A part of the recovery process is relapse. I think fundamentally we only can see it as regression. So what do we do? We just keep reading Paul. 
My lofty desires to do what is good are dashed when I do the things I want to avoid. So if my behavior contradicts my desires to do good, I must conclude that it's not my true identity doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin hindering me from being who I really am. Through my experience of this principle, I discover that when I want to do good, and I love the verbiage there. I don't know if all translations word it that way. When I want to do good, it's like the second you decide to do good. When I want to do good, evil's ready to sabotage me. It's like every time I decide I'm going to do a diet, Ben and Jerry's half off. (laughs) Truly, deep within me, my true identity, I love to do in my true identity, I love to do what pleases God. Anybody actually want to please God? Anybody desires to please God? Anybody struggle with doing that? But I discern another power operating in my humanity, waging a war against the moral principles of my conscience and bringing me into captivity as a prisoner to the law of sin. This unwelcome intruder in my humanity. What an agonizing situation I am in. And that's the word for what we've all been feeling. Agonizing. When you are just so aware of your limitations, in spite of your desires, it's agonizing. And, and Paul says that these, there, there's this force at work. Again, this is where we jump on the devil train. It's the devil. So you got to be aware because he's like a prowling lion. Paul doesn't talk about the devil here. He does in other passages. Sure, there's a devil, there's an enemy, but right here, he's just talking about himself. His inner self, that there is this me that I want to be and this me that I don't want to be. And I am both. I am both. And it's agonizing, church. The reason we have bad rudders, bad mouths, is because of who's driving the ship. It's an unwelcome intruder. We are just Captain Phillips in all of this. And immediately I can tell, nobody's seen that movie. You know the meme, look at me, I am the captain now. Yeah, we Tom Hanks. There's an unwelcome intruder on our ship. And what's harder is it's our own nature. This is what's crazy. And I saw this last night and I was like, yes, okay, I'm putting this in here. I I watched a video on free will, neuroscience perspective on free will. Here's what's crazy. They found, they did some studies. They hooked people up. They could see their brain activity. And what they did was they said, hey, I want you to tell us when you decided to close your hand. So close your hand, and then whenever you decide, hold it open, and then close it. And whenever you decide to do that, just tell us when that was. And what they found is that 200 milliseconds before they close their hand is when they're consciously aware that they decided to close their hand. But a full one second before they close their hand So 800 milliseconds before we are consciously aware that we decided to close our hand, they can see in our activity that our subconscious decided to close the hand. 800 milliseconds before you have consciously become conscious of what you are about to do, the decision was already made. And then they asked the question, could this be exploited? The answer is yes. They played a game where a guy had an earpiece And what the earpiece would do is that full second before the person made the action, in the earpiece, he would get a signal that would say whether they were going to lift up their right hand or lift up their, now you guys know I don't know my right or left. They would lift up their right hand, they would lift up their left hand, and the game was if he could lift up the hand they were going to lift up at the same time, he wins. They put his, rig them up, 
And what they found is that 86% of the time, by looking at the subconscious, a full one second, 800 milliseconds before they were consciously aware that they were gonna lift up their left or their right, 86% of the time they were able to guess right. 86% of the time we are doing, like, it's crazy, not even 86% of the time, 100% of the time, we are doing something that we're not even aware before we've decided to do it. It throws free will into a free fall. Because how am I supposed to master my mind when my subconscious is making decisions that my conscious isn't even aware of? And then my conscious thinks my conscious did it. But it's your subconscious. And it's why trauma is so influential to us. Because we think that's not right. And we make a conscious, rational, logical, over-rationalized explanation of why we have to get into that person's face for disrespecting me, but really we're defending the inner child whose older brother or parent or sibling or bully talked down to and disrespected and said, you're good for nothing. And then when we heard that person as an adult say that, our subconscious said, no, 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 that can't happen again. And so, but consciously, I had every right to get like that. And then you realize how far you are from the standard. And it just feels so defeating. Paul says, what an agonizing situation I am in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the un unwelcome intruder of sin and death? And here's the part where I think Paul deviates. And we can't, at least I don't relate to him because I don't do this often enough. He says, what an agonizing situation I am in. And usually from this point, I start to beat myself up. I start to guilt trip myself. I say, you should know better. You're a failure. Pastor Rose is going to be disappointed in you. Your people that you lead are going to be disappointed in you. You, how could you do this? You know what? You know what, God? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a whole system. And I start trying to earn my way back. And I, but, but Paul doesn't do that. Paul says, who's going to rescue me? See, church, the next time you're in this place, this is, if, if you can get this down, I want you to know you're not meant to feel defeat. You're meant to realize that you need saving. Every time you feel like a failure, the next time you feel like you failed, the next time you feel like you, you, you're a disappointment, the next time you've become aware of how far you are from the, the, the standard and how big this gap is from who you want to be, I want you to realize this, that you are not supposed to feel defeated. You're supposed to become aware of your need for saving. I want you to ask that question next time. Hey, maybe beat yourself a little bit, don't, right? Maybe at, even after that, even after you go, I'm such a disappointment, say this, who's gonna save me? Because there's an answer to that question. But before we can do that, can all my Christians not give spoilers alert, all right? <laughs> Jesus, yeah, I know, we're gonna get there. James chapter three, verses 12 to 13. We have to go back to James, because I don't want you guys to have a bad taste. James, James, after leaving us here, Neither can a spring produce fresh water. He takes us here. If you consider yourself to be wise and one who understands the ways of God, not the ways of yourself, not the ways of, oh, you should be better than this. No, no, the ways of God. Advertise it with a beautiful, fruitful life guided by wisdom's gentleness. Okay, that sounds better, but James, I'm a little wary of you now because last time you gave me some hope. Then he says in verse 17, when the wisdom from above is always pure, filled with peace, considerate and teachable. It is f uh, that the wisdom from above is pure, filled with peace, considerate and teachable. It is filled with love and never displays prejudice or hypocrisy in any form. And it always, I can't bear fresh spring. I can't bear these good things. But this wisdom from above always bears the beautiful harvest of righteousness. And here's what's peculiar about this text. And I'll break it down for a little bit so I can tell you. He's saying that being guided by wisdom, this kind that comes from above, from God, bears a harvest. And then he, he lists these positive qualities, traits that I think we all desire to have. But he says it's, what he's saying is it's, it's this thing that's not me that produces these things. I, I can't produce these things. There's this wisdom from above, this thing from God that produces fruit. Anybody heard that before in other scripture? There's a popular text. It's called the fruits of the spirit. 
In Galatians 5, Paul says, after listing what the fruits of the flesh are, says, the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all of its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace. Oh, peace is here again. Interesting. Patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. It's a very commonly quoted verse. Okay, you guys see the hyperlink? That, that there is something that is produced in us when we are guided by either God's wisdom, his spirit, something that comes from God, not us, produces things in us that we ourselves cannot produce. It's the wisdom of God and his spirit that covers the gap. See, church, you weren't meant to feel defeated. When those feelings come, when you inevitably fall short, short, what should stir up in you is your awareness that you need saving, that you need to be guided by God's wisdom, to, to, to have the Holy Spirit within you activated. That's what you need. And, and what's crazy is there's this guy I don't know if you guys know of him. His name is Jesus. But he actually embodies both. He's the physical embodiment of and the totality of all who God is. The all-encompassing, eternal, can't comprehend. The earth is his footstool. footstool God dwells in this man who existed 2,000 years ago named Jesus of Nazareth. And this is what Paul has to say about him. We can go back to Romans 7. He says, what an agonizing situation I am in. Who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? I need saving. He says, oh, I give all my thanks to God for his mighty power has provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So it's, if left to myself, the flesh is aligned with the law of sin. But now my renewed mind is fixed on and submitted to God's righteous principle. You see, church, the next time you feel defeated, the next time you're aware of your shortcomings, your own ineptitudes, your own inability to handle this ship, Use that as an opportunity to become aware of your need for a savior and embrace that savior because he's already arrived. Embrace the fact that he made a way out of that constant self-defeat, that constant a battle, that constant awareness of I am not enough. He made a way out. And I love that I'm preaching this on Palm Sunday. To be honest, I made this message, got this message, felt like it was from God. And I said, Lord, wait a minute. I got to tie this in with Palm Sunday. What is that again? I just noticed the day we give palms out, to be honest. I looked it up just to be sure. And what Palm Sunday commemorates is Jesus' entry into Jerusalem the week before he was crucified and resurrected. And I'm going I'm to paraphrase this quickly. Here's the essential part, that when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, they started crying out this phrase. It's the Palm Sunday phrase. Hosanna. Hosanna. They started crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. But Hosanna is a Hebrew word. It's actually pronounced Hosanna. And it literally means in the Hebrew and how it was used, they're quoting from Psalm 118. I think Psalm 118, yes, Psalm 118, verse 25, they're quoting it. And what Hosanna means is help. It means save me. That's how it was used in ancient Hebrew context in the period of the Old Testament. What I'm trying to say is that before Jesus, it had this context of save me or I pray, I, I need help. But in this moment, on Palm Sunday that is commemorated, they, the, the, the Hebrews were master wordsmiths and word players, and they would take things that were known and use them in different contexts to give them meaning. We do this all the time, right? If you ask me to turn on a light bulb, I'll go, okay, it's lit. But if something's really cool, it's lit. 
right? So this is what they're doing. They're doing, help me, save me. But they were using it in the mark of Jesus to say, we're saved. In the New Testament, it took on this new life form as a, as an, as a expression of praise. You see, church, before Jesus, Hosanna meant save me. But after Jesus, Hosanna means I am saved. We are saved. We are delivered. We don't got to live in defeat anymore because we are saved. Hosanna. And I love it because in the same breath, the same word that means I need saving is the same word that declares I am saved. And what if we were to embody that mindset that the next time you are aware of your defeat and you're, you were a failure, you would say, I need to be saved. Oh yes, I am saved. I'm such a screw up. Oh wait, I am a conqueror. I'm never gonna be able to win this battle. Oh wait, God has already won it for me. I am stuck in these ways. Oh, God has delivered me from this way. And all of a sudden, a, James that, a verse from James that is depressing and defeating and humbles us, the tongue is this inconquerable thing. In the wake of Jesus' death and burial, burial and resurrection becomes minuscule. Oh wait, I can master this rudder. Oh wait, I can handle this ship because it's not I that handles it. It's not I that lives, but it's he who lives in me. It's Christ alive in me. Hosanna, I needed saving. I am saved. I can't do this. Through Christ, I can do this. Romans 8, subsequent chapter from Romans 7. Team, you guys can join me up here. Paul says, now Christ lives his life in you. And even though your body may be dead because of the effects of sin, his life-giving spirit imparts life to you because you are fully accepted by God. Why am I fully accepted by God? Because Christ lives in you. Not because of your willpower. Because Christ lives in you. Yes, God raised Jesus to life, and since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, he will also raise your dying body to life, the same spirit that breathes life into you. So then, beloved ones, the flesh, the intruder, has no claims on us at all. And we have no further obligation to live in obedience to it. For when you live controlled by the flesh, you are about to die. But if the spirit, the life of the spirit, puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste his abundant life. I asked at the start of this message, does anybody want to wish they could be perfect? Does anybody wish they could taste? I didn't ask this part, but I'm going to combine them. Does anybody wish they could have abundant life? It's not about your willpower. And could it be that we find ourselves, not even could it be because I've been there, I've experienced it, that we find ourselves at the place of defeat and defeat and defeat because we're not accepting the fact that it is finished, it is finished, it is finished, that we are trying on our own power, but we don't got to use willpower. We have Holy Spirit power. We have Jesus living his life in us, power that can conquer a tongue, that can defeat a fire, that can defeat our shortcomings, that came to close the gap. So what if we just stopped trying and we just allowed Christ to do it in us? And church, I've seen it. Therapy is amazing. I recommend it. But therapy is not what transforms your life. My own mentor, who's a practicing psychologist, has said this. The, the, the cracks in Christian counseling are that there are some Christian counselors who are just doing the counseling and are Christians. And what makes us different from secular psychology and counseling if we're just bringing them to the same place that earthly methods can bring them, but we're not pointing them to Jesus, the only one who can transform lives. And please, nobody come out of here and say, Ruben said, I just need Jesus. I don't need a therapist. No, I will lose my ship. Yeah. Someone says that. I believe in medication, I believe in 
books. I, I, I love the Enneagrams. The, the, the Marqueses will tell you themselves, though, and they're Enneagram nerds. The Enneagram can't transform your life and save you. Only Jesus can. These things are great tools. It, it's not a job. It's not a career. It's not a family. It's not that one next level up. It is only Jesus that can transform your life. All these things are supplemental and supplements are great. I just started taking supplements. They're amazing. Found out my amygdala is huge. That's why my anxiety is huge. I just started taking GABA. That does nothing if I'm not putting into practice certain principles. But that does nothing if I'm not accepting the fact that the Bible says that I can cast all my anxieties to him and be anxious for nothing. And that when I give God my worries, he takes care of them. You know what the, the ultimate, guys, I've seen it. Like I've seen addicts, addicted people free in a day, no withdrawals, no rehab, none of it. I've seen people dealing with unforgiveness for years, bitterness for years gone no therapy no counseling none of those things and all of those things are great but Jesus can cut through all of those things Jesus can do the work that takes years in seconds I've seen him do it in my own life even when the thing that I was set free from came back and I caught it so willingly all I had to do was here you go dad here you go Jesus I want to be done with this again and then it comes back. I want to be done with this again. I've seen Jesus do it. And again, all of those things are great. Your pastors are amazing. I think I'm pretty good too. But they're not the thing. Bro will tell you. And in the wake of this Hillsong documentary, please let me tell you, don't worship me. Don't follow me. Just follow where I'm pointing, because I'm pointing to Jesus. I will tell you, I've known this man for 28 years. I'm his brother. Lisa's been married to him for I don't know how long. He's human too. What I love about Pastor Rowe is that he knows that he's human. A lot of pastors don't. And he'll say, don't follow me. Follow Jesus. So church, not even your pastors, like church, follow Jesus. You could, you could trust in us, sure, but trust in us as long as we're pointing you to Jesus. The second this finger goes like this, I, I'm going to tell you now, I give you permission, run away. Second I go like this, you guys deserve, no, run away. Follow those who are pointing you to Jesus. Supplements are great. But I don't want to be living in a world where I'm dependent on stop gaps and temporary fixes. I want to be truly free. And it's only Jesus that can do that. Jesus before James, before Paul, we're ever talking about producing. Jesus says this in John chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. I am the sprouting vine, and you are my branches. As you live in union with me, as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. How do I be fruitful? Live in Jesus. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. And if a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Such, as, such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. And we love to misquote this part too. You don't want to be discarded. This is the proof text for hell, y'all. You're going to be burned. My man, it's a metaphor. It's, it's the metaphor of here's the byproduct of powerlessness. We become weak. We become discarded. But if you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire. Ask if you guys desire to be good. Anybody desire to be good still? Well, you can ask whatever you desire if you're in union with Jesus and it'll be done. You can forgive whoever you need to forgive if you live in Jesus and it'll be done. You could overcome any bad attitude, any personal issue, any illness, 
if you live in union with Jesus. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my, my mature disciples. What is that thing about being a mature disciple? What do I have to do again? Live in Jesus. Glorify my Father. Church, how do we handle this ship? Stop trying to play captain. Honestly, we abandon ship and realize we can't. And we need to get into the, the vessel of Jesus and live in him and let him live his life out through us and do what we cannot do. And I'm not saying you just live in Jesus and get to do whatever, and you get to curse him out and think that God, that he covered that gap for you, cursing them out. No, no, no. It's because Jesus lives in us that we can take on the challenge of, I can't believe he said that to me. And I can't believe that through Jesus, I have the power to turn the other cheek. I need saving. I am saved. Hosanna. Hosanna. I need saving. I am saved. How do we how do we do this though? Number one, you need to be in community. You cannot do this alone. You need people who will point you to Jesus and will point out, like, hey, you, you need a little bit of Jesus in that area. Hey, I know I know I know it's hard. I know I know it feels impossible, but 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 let's let's go to Jesus. These four friends, I love the way Pastor Roe always preaches this message. These four friends took a layman to Jesus. And it's because of the faith of the four, man, four men that the man was healed. It wasn't his faith. Couldn't even bring himself to Jesus. And some days we are the person who needs someone else to bring us to Jesus. So you need to be in community. This is my PSA. I think as long as I preach, I will always bring it here. Get counseling. Godly Christian counseling I can't think I went to my uh, counselor in the midst of a panic attack anxiety attack suicidal ideation said I need, she said well, okay so what brings you here I said I need to get rid of my anxiety she said okay why and I was just like bro you got a degree anxiety's bad I said, well, why do you need it? I need to get rid of it. I said, well, because of, at the time I wasn't a pastor. I said, I'm going to be a pastor. I know what I'm going to be. I know I'm called to do these amazing, these, these big things. And I don't think I can function with anxiety at that level and not have a mental breakdown. So I need to fix it today. And she said, do you need to fix it? She, she, she talked to me about Paul and the thorn in his side and he, he, he pleaded and pleaded and pleaded for God to get rid of it but in his God revealed to him that it was in Paul's weakness that God's strength was made perfect and then he learned to embrace the thing that was killing him and she said Ruben what if anxiety is your thorn and I said get behind me Satan so what if, what if anxiety is your thorn that God wants to use to glorify himself through? You know what's crazy? Embracing that is the thing that set me free. But it took someone with the insights of mental health and the in tuneness of spirituality to take me to that place. Another psychologist probably would have recommended medication, which medication can be good, but it can't be the, the answer all that apply that we always hit. Just a Christian, I've seen people who their title is reverend and they say they're doctors. I'm like, uh, would you say you just need to pray? Just need to pray the devil and the anxiety away. Pray is great. I believe prayer does a lot of things. But I needed both. So please get you some counseling. Get you someone who will take your troubles and your issues and show you how to bring them to Jesus. Go to Matrix. Attend Matrix. It is nine months that is just pointing you to Jesus, pointing you to Jesus, pointing you to Jesus. Hey, here's what you're dealing with. Let's point you to Jesus. Let's point you to Jesus. Let's give it to Jesus.
Last two things. Stop trying to earn your righteousness. Stop it. Stop. If there's one thing I'll condemn someone for, try to be righteous. Stop. Stop it. You can't. Fundamentally, the way this thing worked is that Jesus came because we couldn't be righteous. It says that for all have short, fallen short of the glory of God. It says that while we were enemies, Jesus died for us. You, what qualifies you for righteousness is that you're not qualified for it. What makes you worthy of Jesus and this Christian thing is that you weren't worthy and you needed saving. It's why we say saved and unsaved. And I'm not even really a fan of the unsaved terminology. But we're saved because we needed saving. There's those who are rescued and those who haven't been rescued yet. It's the fundamental principle. How you say I'm saved, but I gotta like earn this lifeboat that I'm in. So please, church, stop trying to earn your righteousness. Because the second you try to earn it, your willpower is activated and your willpower is not enough. And lastly, worship your heart out. Just worship, worship, worship. That's why we worship on Sundays. I can give a great talk, great message that moves us, but what connects us is worship. And, and I, I selected this song particularly today, if we could all stand. Because I feel like it's the song that will, that will drive this home. Like it's the song of yes, I'm giving it to Jesus. Yes, I'm giving up on defeat and resting in his victory. It's the song of Lord, I'm going to just live in your love. And, and I'm not gonna do an altar call today, but I do wanna do a worship call. And so if any part of this message, honestly, I'm going to be, if 2% of this message hit home, church, I need you here for worship. Less than six feet from, we can say that now. I need you here. Because I, I feel like this, this message is good, but we have to connect now to him. And we got to sing this out with all of our soul. The lyrics are going to be there, but hey, even if you mess up on the lyrics, just put your heart out there. Like, Lord, you love me. Lord, I'm here. And Lord, I'm giving up on my willpower. I'm giving up on my willpower, church. I'm going to pray for us and we're going to worship. Ooh. Who put that there? Get behind me, saint. Anyway. Now I'm going to lament about being defeated. No, I'm kidding. Um, Lord, I just thank you for this community, Christ Uncensored House of Worship. I thank you for what you're doing each and every to, on, in each and every life here. I pray for the people at home. And by the way, if you're at home, come to the front too. Get as close to that TV screen, that laptop screen, that phone screen. Come. Come close. I pray for everybody here, and I pray that this may be the last day not that we don't feel defeat, because I know failure is going to come. Failure is just a fundamental, a part of life coming up short. As we get closer, we will feel further. But I ask that you will always remind us that your son came near when we were the furthest. Why did Jesus come at the time that he came? Because it was when humanity was the furthest. And you came to close in the gap. So every time we feel far, may we just cling to your son. And that this song may be sowed into our DNA, into the very fibers of our being, Lord. And if there's anyone here who wants to just place their faith in him, maybe you never placed your faith in Jesus. I want us to say this prayer together. We're going to say it. I'm not going to pull you out, but we're going to say it together because we're a family. I'm just going to repeat after me. Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. Today I choose to follow you. In your name, amen. Are you guys ready to worship?